Alright, week 4 has a lot of good exercises. We're actually going to start with a little bit of a warm-up exercise on page 4e of your packet, which talks about a recombinant DNA experiment. This should look familiar to you because it was on an assessment. I really like this experiment because it also teaches a couple of important things not related to the concepts being taught. The first is that you get to see the purpose of controls. The second thing I like is that it can help you think like a scientist, especially for designing an experiment. So take a second to read through the page, especially trying to understand the purpose and methods, but don't look at the data just yet. We'll talk about it together. Also, a quick suggestion, underline and label things as you read through the page. Go ahead and pause the video now. By now you should be able to tell me about the purpose and methods. The purpose is in the first sentence where it says, Subclone. We're trying to clone a gene. For the purposes of this video, let's say we're trying to clone and express the gene that produces insulin. People with type 1 diabetes need insulin to help their cells take up glucose. As for the methods, words like eco R1, digestion, linearize are clues to knowing that we're cutting DNA with a restriction enzyme. Also, the plates we're using to kill bacteria that didn't take up a vector have ampicillin on them. That means the selectable marker is an ampicillin resistance gene. What we do in real life might be something like going online and ordering a bunch of vectors that have the ampicillin resistance gene and a polylinker that has an eco R1 cut site. Now, still with our methods, let's talk about controls. There are additional experimentation that we do in order to more reliably draw conclusions from our data. They can help us ensure that we've done the experiment correctly or that the experiment is working properly. In a second, when we look at the data, we'll talk about the significance of each one, as well as what problems we would run into if we were to skip out on them. Now, in mentioning the data, for the next little while, please don't look at the data. I want us to start thinking like scientists by having something expected and then comparing it to what we observed. This also happens a lot in genetics. So for the next part, have a piece of paper or use the back side of the previous page to draw each control, what you put in and what you expect to see. I'll be drawing them also. Okay, here's the first control. Bacterial cells not exposed to any vector. Why did we do that? Now please note that the insert doesn't come into play until your actual experimental trial. But these bacteria never got the chance to take up the vector, which means which has the selectable marker on it. So basically, we're putting on bacteria onto these plates with ampicillin. Your drawing might look something like this. What would we expect my plate to look like after a few days? Just plain old bacteria, never got the vector, therefore never got the resistance to the antibiotic. So I'd expect, so I'd expect nothing to be growing on my plates. So in drawing the plates, it should look something like this. Now control B, we plated cells transformed with uncut vector. So let's pretend I get the shipment of vectors in the mail and try to get bacteria to take it up. I'll do so through a series of steps involving heat shocking the bacteria into making them what is called competent. This is done by alternating hot and cold environments which allows the vector to pass through the bacteria's membrane. So drawing it might look something like this. What would you expect to see on these plates? Well, the ones that took up the vector will be able to grow, so I'd expect to see bacteria growing. And remember, this is all a prediction of what is expected, but we're not actually looking at the data just yet. In control C, I plated cells with vector that was linearized, then incubated with ligase. Linear DNA is useless to bacteria, but because I also incubated the DNA with ligase, I'd expect ligase to fix the cut created, reforming the circular DNA. So the drawing might look something like this. What I might expect to see is growth, maybe not as many as in B because they would have had to be ligased first. That additional step in getting a circular vector would reduce the number of bacteria that could actually grow. Finally, in control D, we did everything the same except we also added alkaline phosphatase after our vector was linearized. Though it doesn't mention, we would have also needed to purify it afterwards, which would then be followed by incubation with ligase, but with no insert. Do you remember what phosphatase does? Do you remember that do you remember what ligase needs to be able to do its job? So because the phosphate groups are missing and there is no insert to provide phosphate groups to work with, ligase can't help the vector become circular again. Because of this, 
What would your drawing look like? What would you expect to see on these plates? Since the vector has been dephosphatized, it will remain linear, which means none of the bacteria would have been able to use its selectable marker. If everything went smoothly, I'd expect no bacteria to grow on my plates because all of the DNA has been linearized and can't be ligased back together. While simultaneously doing all of these controls, we're also doing our own experiment, which is identical to control D, but this time we add in the insert at the end. During the incubation with ligase, we'd expect and hope that there will be some growth, albeit not very much. Okay, before you go on to the video, please make sure you understand each of those controls. Now, know what each control's purpose was, as well as what we expected to see. If you need a second, pause the video now. Okay, I still don't want you to look at the data. I've written the data on the screen, thus to allow us to look just at this as if we were the scientists doing this experiment. The first time we did this, here were our results. TMTC across the board, meaning too many colonies of bacteria to count on each plate. But wait, we had expected to see some plates with nothing growing. Which ones? Take a second and look at your notes. Which controls were those? If you look back at your notes, you'll remember that A shouldn't have had anything growing because they never got the vector. D wasn't supposed to grow either because the vectors were all linearized and dephosphatized, meaning they couldn't be ligased back together. What could be one reason that could account for TMTC in both of these plates? Well, let's look at the earliest control since each control in this experiment builds on the previous one. That way, we should be able to find the reason why. It's got to be something from the very start. Take a second and think of a few possible reasons. Okay, one reason could be that you forgot to put ampicillin in your plates. The thing that was supposed to kill them wasn't even there. That means all the bacteria would have lived, regardless of whether or not they had the vector. Another potential reason could be that the bacteria you, you're using already had resistance to ampicillin. One reason that can't explain it though is that the phosphatase wasn't added or wasn't working. That's because, that's because it wasn't even used in control A. So the data can't be used because our expected results from control A and control D were completely different from what we actually observed. So we tried again and got a second group of results. Here's the data. This time, instead of TMTC, we get nothing all, in all of our plates. Although this was supposed to happen in plates A and D, that wasn't supposed to happen out in all of the others. So if I was your intern and gave you these results, what would you say? What did I do wrong? Once again, let's look at the earliest control since these ones build on each other. The first control I was expecting to see growth in was control B. What was control B's purpose? Well, if you'll remember, we got the vector in the mail and immediately tried to get bacteria to take it up. So one of the reasons why none of the bacteria lived could be that none of the bacteria were competent or maybe I didn't do the heat shock properly, killing the bacteria or preventing any of them from being able to take up the vector. It wouldn't, however, be because the ligase wasn't working because I didn't even add ligase into control B. Ever the optimist, as the packet says, you allow me, your intern, to do it once more. This time we get results that look like this. Okay, at first glance, it looks better. Let's look at the results from each control. A, nothing lived. That was expected. They were just plain bacteria. B, we see high growth. What was that expected? Why? C, we see fewer colonies than B. Was that expected? Then D, we see 21 colonies of bacteria growing. Was that expected? What does that mean? What was control D's purpose again? Finally, our experimental trial, we saw 38 colonies. As your intern, you might hear me say, Win! We got 38 colonies of bacteria with the insulin gene successfully transformed. What would you tell me? Are all 38 of these colonies good ones? Let's say there were two different types of colonies and it was easy for us to tell the difference between the two. For example, one type was fuzzy and the other was glossy. Seeing two different types of colonies isn't what we expected though. So let's say we got three of each. To confirm, what could you do to find out which of these colonies, the fuzzy or the glossy, actually had the vector with the sub-cloned gene? Take a second to think of your answer now. Well, we decide to redigest the bacteria's DNA with E. coli R1, then do a southern blot, adding a probe for both the ampicillin resistance gene and the insulin gene. Here are my results. Which one, the fuzzy or the glossy, have successfully been sub-cloned? 
Okay, take a second and answer the related questions on page 4F and from the assessment. Now, on to exercise A. Read through and look for the four steps. Pause the video now. For the purpose, study nucleosome organization and structure. Methods, limited digestion with micrococcal nuclease, so cutting up the linkers, but not the nucleosomes, and in a limited manner, meaning it wasn't digested completely, but stopped early, not mentioned in this page, is the fact that Kornberg isolated the DNA, denatured the proteins, so that all he had left was DNA, then he ran it on a gel. The first time, he got something that looked like the ladder on the right. The second time he did it, he took the DNA from each of those bands in the ladder and ran it in its own lane, like this. Data. There are sets of clusters of DNA that I see on this gel, each around the 200, 400, 600, and 800 lengths, with nothing in between. Also, the clusters are relatively of the same size, meaning, meaning the variation in the DNA in those clusters is about the same. Let's talk about the cluster around 200 base pairs. Additional testing would have shown you that the bottom of the cluster is 150 base pairs, while the top of the cluster is 250. Results. Now, using the data and knowing the methods, we should be able to draw conclusions about our purpose. Micrococcal nuclease doesn't cut anywhere there's a nucleosome, but instead, it separates nucleosomes by cutting the linker connecting the two. In reality, the smallest a micrococcal nuclease can cut one nucleosome is by cutting it without any of the linkers on either side. That's what the 150 base pairs represents. If I was to incubate my DNA with micrococcal nuclease for a day and for a week, assuming that those enzymes could last that long, the shortest I would ever get it would be at 150, nothing shorter. The biggest a micrococcal nuclease could cut out one nucleosome is 250, with full-length linkers on both sides. That means the amount of DNA wrapped around a nucleosome is 150 base pairs, and the linker in between is 50. The next group, the one centered around 400, represents two nucleosomes and has the bottom being 350 because that's the smallest a micrococcal nuclease can cut two nucleosomes, that is, two segments of 150 and one segment of 50 in between the two. The biggest, then, is 450, and so on for three and four nucleosomes. Now the conclusions. There are a few conclusions we can take from this. The clusters are equally distances apart on a gel and are also relatively the same size. This suggests that the nucleosomes are equally spaced. Quick question, what would the gel look like if the nucleosomes weren't equally spaced? As in, what if they could be anywhere from 25 to 50 base pairs instead? It'd look the same for the first nucleosome, but what about the second and third and so on? What would you notice to the cluster as the number of nucleosomes increased? Now, really quickly for exercise B, the reason we see smears instead of nice clusters as we did with eukaryotic chromatin is because there's every length of DNA inside that smear. This is because the linkers are very long in comparison to our DNA. Let's use the same reasoning we use to measure the clusters to measure the smears. After 30 minutes, the smallest the DNA was being cut into evened out at around 300 base pairs. This must represent the DNA in a nucleosome. If there weren't nucleosomes present, the DNA would have just been digested all the way to the point of individual nucleotides and would run straight through the gel instead of stopping at a set length. So if the nucleosomes are 300 base pairs long, that's the smallest one nucleosome can be cut. The longest though, if the linker were say 500 base pairs long, would be would be 1300 base pairs, right? That range represents all the possible lengths that could be cut from one nucleosome. Let's look at if we had two nucleosomes. The smallest we could cut the DNA if we had two nucleosomes would be 1100 base pairs, and the biggest would be 2100 base pairs long. Do you see how these two intervals overlap? That means we could get anything from 300 base pairs all the way up to 21 base pairs long, which would look like a smear instead of separate clusters for just two nucleosomes. And then it would be the same for three nucleosomes and four nucleosomes and so forth. For the last exercise, exercise C, because of time, I'm only going to give you some hints and the answers, assuming you'll take the time to work through it on your own. I like this one. 
Work through the exercise on your own. If you need to, watch the video, watch the rest for the hints and answers. Pause the video now. Okay, so to summarize this experiment, there are two genes you want to put together to form a hybrid gene. It's cut initially by BAMH1, making two segments. You run it on a gel several times. The first time, you take the two segments that were created by BAMH1 and get two bands from it. Each following time you run the gel has increasing lengths of ligation. In other words, you're incubating it with ligase. Over time, you see fewer and fewer of the lower bands and more and more higher bands showing up. Here's a hint. What does it mean to be a sticky end? What needs to be the same in order for two sticky ends to stick together? To confirm, you recut the DNA with the original BAMH1 restriction enzyme and you get the original segments you started with. The reason why we're getting fewer and fewer shorter bands is because they're being used up as, they're, as the sticky ends are sticking to the longer pieces. Over, so over time we're just getting bigger and bigger pieces because all of the sticky ends are being put together. In the second half of the ex experiment, you take all of the DNA from the band that measured 1.3 kilobase pairs long because that's the size of the DNA of the two segments together. After purifying the DNA, you added EcoR1, which cuts at different places and gives you several bands. Why? According to the map at the top, EcoR1 should have only cut twice. Once again, the clue is the sticky ends, but this time it's with the twist. Yes, you got DNA that just had two segments put together, looking the same as the one in your packet or as the one that I've drawn here, but is that arrangement the only way you could get a 1.3 kilobase pair segment? Here's the answer to number three's exercise. The green arrow is showing you different arrangements with some of them rotating at 180 degrees.